Thank you, band. All right, well, this morning we are going to be talking about the resurrection. You might be thinking to yourself, if you know the timeline, wait a minute, you're a week early, and that would be true. But this is, this is going to set up our hearts to celebrate Easter. And so this morning, I want us to think about why this moment, this miracle, this act of God is so pivotal, crucial, critical to our faith. The Apostle Paul said that without the crucifixion, our faith, this is a Zach paraphrase, Say meaning, our faith is a sham. And so the resurrection is pivotal. Gotta be honest with you guys, I'm not ready to to preach a message this morning. My brain is tired and (laughs) I am not uh, uh, gonna be as sharp as I usually am and so we, as always, lean on the Lord, and I want to just go turn to Scripture to start us off this morning, and so we're going to open our Bibles, turn on our devices, and go to Luke chapter 24. The heading in my Bible says, Jesus has risen. Let me read it to us. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared, and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, let's emphasize wondering, right? Maybe dumbfounded would be a good word. Shocked. Stunned. Verse 4, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? If you're following along in your Bible, underline the word living if you're that type of note taker. For he is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Verse 11, but they did not believe the women, because their their words seemed to them like nonsense. Nonsense. They couldn't make sense of what they were hearing. These ladies must have gone crazy. People don't just come back from the dead. We saw him die. We were there when he was buried. Some have claimed like, oh, maybe he just was injured really badly and he like slept it off over three days. No, that's nonsense, right? (laughs) A man who needs medical attention, even if that were somewhere remotely true, is not just going to sleep it off over three days. Like the, the medical evidence that we have learned where his side is pierced and both blood and water flows means that he was dead. But for the past 2,000 years, people have been trying to make sense of the resurrection. And it matters. It makes all the difference in the world. The, the, these ladies were trying to make sense of it. They go back and they tell Jesus' of Jesus's followers, and they're trying to make sense of how, how can this be? What is going on here? What happened? People don't just walk out of graves. Without God. See, if we, if we remember God's stories, if we remember how he works, we can start putting the pieces together. And for the early disciples, as, 
as Jesus starts appearing to them in the flesh, as he starts walking with them and teaching with them, teaching them again for about a 40-day period before he ascends to heaven, for them, it must have all started to make sense. Maybe not every piece, right? It was, it was you know, a few years until they got around to writing down their eyewitness accounts of this happening. But the pieces must have started falling into place for them because Jesus is their king, our king. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is what makes it all actually make sense. It bewildered them in the moment. It confused them at a time. These guys were all hiding in a house, not knowing where to go next. If you, if you read on in, in verse 24 here, there's this you know, beautiful scene where two of them are like, well, that's it. Let's head back to uh, the fishing boats or whatever they were heading back to do. They were on the road to Emmaus. They were, they were leaving Jerusalem and they were headed home, back to our old lives, back to our jobs. And Jesus appears to them. They don't, they're not, they don't initially recognize him. And they're walking along and they're saying, and he's like, what are you guys talking about? It's kind of a cool scene. Jesus asks like, what's up, dude? <laughs> what are you guys talking about? And they're like, uh, haven't you heard? Like only the biggest thing to happen ever, but, we, but everybody's talking about it because nobody can make sense of it yet. Jesus, he died. Our hopes and our dreams were dashed, smashed to bits and pieces. And then he goes missing. Some people say he's raised from the dead. They're trying to make sense of the resurrection. But we don't really have context for that. Because think about our lives. Everywhere we look, we see the consequences, the results, the eventuality of death. We look in the mirror every day and we see ourselves aging. Right? We, we go turn on the news and we, we hear about wars, about famine, about some sort of conflict between people. We, we, we check our, our map app on our phone to see, like, you know, where are the car accidents because we just know they're going to be there. And often somebody died in one of those accidents today. But we just know that they're there. We live in a world immersed in death. And so this news of life, of resurrection, it's like we don't have context for it in our everyday life. We don't know how to place it. I want to turn back kind of the memory reel, and I'll, I'll try to fill in the holes for you too if, you, if you're not tracking with me. If I don't fill in the holes, come ask me afterwards. <laughs> um, this story, a historical account, happens to a whole bunch of young Jewish men and women who are following this guy named Jesus. And in the Jewish story, they had been rescued out of Egypt. They had, they, had a, they had a forefather, Abraham, who was promised that, that, that they would have a, a nation and that they would have like this, this place to, to, to live and walk with God. And that from their brethren, their descendants, they would be somehow a blessing to the entire world. And so God rescues them out of Egypt. He brings them into this promised land. He gives them a code of, of law of like how you can live as my people. To be my representatives, not mine, physically God, right? To be God's representatives to the world. There was like 613 laws, I think, if I'm remembering right depending on how you classify them, where you stop, stop one and start the next. 
And some of them, if you read through them today, if you go back to like Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and you read some of those today, it will make no sense to you. There are things like, well, if you touch a, a dead body, you can't come to church kind of things, okay? And you're like, what? Like, but this is the context that this story happens in. And what God was doing for them was he was building a context for them to interpret the life of Christ through. Because see, our God doesn't work the way the world works. And so the, the disciples and everybody since has been trying to fit Jesus and the resurrection into some sort of a box that we can understand. Some sort of a category that fits everything that we've experienced in our lives. But we only know death prior to knowing Jesus. And all of these laws that, that God gave to the Israelite people to help them put Jesus into context, it took some mulling over and some thinking about and some dwell time before the disciples started to get it and went, whoa, do you see that? All of those laws were about life. Because the reason why God doesn't fit into one of our boxes is our context of the world that we live in is, is, is immersed in death. We, we see things like degrading all around us, right? All those things I listed before. And God set apart something, a, a set of laws for a group of people so that they would recognize the difference between life and death. Like, if, if, you, if you were exposed to death, you couldn't come into the presence of a holy God who was all about life because he was keeping life and death separate. He wasn't trying to exclude anybody. He was helping them learn that our God is a God of life. And so this is where it starts to get really cool. The disciples looking back on Jesus' earthly ministry and looking back on the resurrection, start putting the pieces together that this, this God we serve, whom we follow, is all about life. He's the creator of life. He's the one who breathes life into dead and broken people. There were multiple resurrections that Jesus performed miracles before he went to the cross, resurrecting people. He is the God who, can, who breathed life into creation and can breathe life into dead things. And so this thing that, that everyone fears ultimately somewhere back in our psyche, this Messiah has conquered. The first takeaway we have about why the resurrection matters that our God has disarmed death. They, came, they expected the Messiah to show up with an army who could, who could drive out and conquer the Romans. But think about what that means. The, the, the implications are they were going to try to fight death with more death. Right? The Romans were bullies. But in order to keep the peace, the, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, they exerted a heavy, heavy hand of violence against not just their enemies, but the people that they subjugated within their own nation. And so violence and death was the tool the tyrant used to keep the people in line and to hold on to his kingdom. And that was the only context that the Israelites had for a king until Jesus came. And the implication of Jesus walking out of the grave and conquering death means that he doesn't have to operate the way every other king in the history of the world has operated because he's not a tyrant, he's the anti-tyrant. He's not a, a, a heavy-handed king, but he's a loving servant king. And so the, the, the implication of, of the of the, the uh, resurrection is that he has disarmed this weapon of the enemy and he doesn't even have to use it to build his kingdom. Let that sink in for a second. 
Jesus doesn't have to kill to build his kingdom. He doesn't have to kill to disarm and defeat his enemies. He very well could have. We see the power of God, the wrath of God in like the story of Noah and the flood. He, he could have, but what, but what takes even more power is to win with life. And God has disarmed death. The, sec- the second implication of the resurrection is that Jesus really is the Messiah. That scriptures have been fulfilled. That that this, this king that you are waiting for does exist. David writing down these psalms, these prayers and these songs that he that he was you know, dreaming of and waiting on the Messiah, which is very unique if you think about it because David was in line for the throne and then later was the king as he's writing these things down. And yet he had this heart after God where he wasn't, he wasn't holding on to his own kingdom. He knew he was a steward of God's kingdom. And so he's, he's yearning for, praying for, singing about the coming king, the Messiah. And God made this promise to him. And you can find it in like Psalm 78, I believe, where one of your descendants will sit on the throne forever. How does that even make sense? Well, when the Messiah comes, the one who can conquer death, again, he breaks our categories because he can sit on the throne forever. He can rule a kingdom for eternity. And so these things that maybe seemed like it was just too good to be true kind of language, all of a sudden are making sense in the person of Jesus because of the resurrection. The third implication of the resurrection is that Jesus can rescue us from slavery. It was a treasured part of, of the, the Israel's story, the nation's story, celebrated this very time of year every year with Passover. That, that God was the God who rescues them and he rescued them out of slavery in Egypt. But what they found was that over and over and over again they were enslaved by some other nation. Over and over and over again, they were, they were held down or oppressed by some earthly ruler. But what Jesus taught, what the, what the resurrection confirms for us, is that Jesus has conquered not just death, but sin as well. Because not only can he breathe life into dead things, but he can eradicate the, the, even the cause of death from within us. Because scripture tells us that the wages of sin, what we have earned, what we deserve, the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus can ultimately set us free from the ultimate slavery to one that is so rooted and ingrained in us that it feels like we can never be free of it on our own, that we need a higher power to free us because we can't free ourselves. He can free us from the very thing that keeps leading us right back into slavery, the sin in our hearts. And fourth... There was a whole new political implication. A whole new political implication of this kingdom. When Jesus came, you know, claimed to be the Messiah, when people were looking for the Messiah, it didn't just mean that he was going to be their, their savior and their rescuer. It also literally meant he would be their king. The Sermon on the Mount is often called a political manifesto. When Jesus claimed to be king of the Jews and was even mocked for it at the cross, 
the reason why that like stirred up so many people was that he was challenging Caesar himself. And nobody did that. Anybody who ever even thought of doing that, we don't hear about in the history books anymore because Caesar destroyed them in such grandiose fashion that we don't even know about them anymore. Nobody did that. But the political implication of Jesus' claim to be Messiah and then, his, and then his resurrection to prove that he is the Messiah is that he will rule the nations. Scripture tells us that there's no weapon that's formed that we can't stand up against because Jesus has already disarmed them. And so he can be a king who can stand for eternity. He can be the king that can answer all of the heart longings of the Israelite people and us. He can be a king who can root out the, the, the source of slavery from within our hearts. And he can be the king that not only conquers his enemies and disarms his enemies, but can welcome all into his kingdom. Do you realize how divisive we are in the world. Everybody in our natural inclination is to pick a side on everything. Now, I love, you know, picking a side when we watch basketball. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about turn on the news and look at a political conflict and we want to pick a side. We want those guys to be the bad guys and these guys to be a, the good guys. What shocked the disciples was when Jesus walked up to the enemies of the Israelite people, Samaritans, Romans, etc., and they were welcomed. They were welcomed into the family. They were welcomed into his kingdom because his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom was a kingdom of hearts. His kingdom was a kingdom that is now but not yet because it will be fully consummated and realized at some point in the future where there is a new heaven and a new earth and the resurrection proves it. The resurrection makes all the difference. Without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. And so we do have to think about this. We do have to make sense of the resurrection. But his story, from start to finish, teaches us how beautiful God's plan is, how wonderful his works are, how, how brilliant he is, and how his wisdom far exceeds ours. And so let's pray. And let's worship him today on this Palm Sunday. Father God, you are God and we are just men and women seeking you. Unworthy of, of your attention and your love and yet you graciously, sacrificially, extravagantly give yourself for us. And so Father, I pray that you open the, the eyes of our minds, that you soften our hearts to be able to see and accept who you are on your terms, on how, by how you've revealed yourself to us, so that we can be blessed this Palm Sunday and this, this Easter season, this Holy Week, with, with awe and wonder as we come before you to, to worship out of a purity of, of heart, of just knowing who you are and how much you love us. Father, I pray that every day our hearts learn to love you more and more. Love you with our affection. Love you with our, with, with, with our, our energy. Love you with our, our entire being, Lord, and love you self-sacrificially as we, as we 
bear your image and, and, and reflect that out to the world around us. God, you are so, so good. You are so, so wise. And your ways are beyond anything I can imagine. How you planned out this story and executed it, culminating it with a, with a resurrection is, is almost unbelievable. And so, Father, we, we ask that you build up our faith because believing in this gives us life. It, it, it awakens our imaginations, our, our hearts, our desires to good things and to your good plan that's, that's being played out all around us. And so in a world that is characterized by death and destruction, you are this gleaming, brilliant light. And so we worship you. We thank you. We praise you, Jesus, because you are worthy of all of our praise. Amen.